I hunted down and found these audio tapes. First of all, they had the voices of the guys. Kids, it's so hard to get Jordan to do anything now. You know? <laughs> I'd known all these guys for years, but here I had them in a historical archival manner. It sounded real. Myself and my agent, Scott Waxman, thought, why don't we do a podcast on it? The Dream Team has never really gone out of fashion. It's amazing how relevant in the culture these guys still are. Primarily Jordan, Magic, Bird, but they know everybody still. Carl Malone and John Stockton are in the final two episodes. These guys are still a big part of the sporting cultures. I hit it kind of lucky. Then you are in Australia right now. You're talking NBA basketball. You're talking great teams. You're talking great individual players. Takes it off and there's number 23. And of course, Johnny goes nuts. So we're all getting first bumps thinking about it now. I just tried to go out there and play my game. I have no idea what you're talking about, Adam. I don't like anybody. I'm not a people person. Strand, you made the pass. Yes. Christian, can you catch the ball? Yes. All the stars were aligned and all the muscles fired at the right time. And I was able to get off the ground and throw one down. I was saving that as a surprise for you. And now, introducing your host for In All Airness, Adam Ryan. Welcome to episode 106. Thanks for joining me. Today, I'm excited to welcome legendary Sport Illustrated writer, author, and Basketball Hall of Famer, Jack McCallum, to the show. We cover a variety of great topics, including Jack's new podcast series, The Dream Team Tapes. Of course... That leads to his excellent 2012 book, the aptly titled Dream Team. You'll hear its full title shortly. We also chat about Jack's book's golden days, seven seconds or less, and unfinished business. Jack discusses his research methods and offers up some great advice for aspiring writers. We also talk about The Last Dance, ESPN's 10-part docuseries that recently finished. Stay tuned too for an anecdote for the ages featuring 1980s NBA veteran Darren Day. Only made possible thanks to a 2012 blog post from another fantastic author, Jeff Perlman. His book Showtime on the 1980s Lakers is an absolute gem. This conversation was recorded just after episode two of Jack's podcast series had gone live. Towards the end of the episode, I'll share another great podcast review. If you can spare a moment or two, please add your review via your listening app. It'd be most appreciated. Show notes for this episode and access to a huge archive of past episodes are available at inallairness.com. Now, onto the show. My guest today wrote for Sports Illustrated for almost 30 years, and he has authored some of the greatest basketball history books ever, including 2012's Dream Team, How Michael, Magic, Larry, Charles and the greatest team of all time conquered the world and changed the game of basketball forever. He entered the Basketball Hall of Fame in 2005, honoured with the Kurt Gaudia Media Award for print. Jack McCallum, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me, Adam. It's great to have you on the show and I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule these days, uh, even though we're homebound, to talk about uh, a few old school basketball topics. Uh, I mentioned your Dream Team book just a moment ago as A, it's one of my favourites of all time and B, because you've just recently released the opening episodes of, I believe, an eight-part podcast series, The Dream Team Tapes, devoted to that iconic 1992 team. First of all, congrats on the podcast. Thoroughly uh, entertaining and funny. For those not in the know, what, what is the origin story of The Dream Team Tapes? Well, for some reason unknown to me, I saved all the audio tapes for my interviews with these guys. The interviews were basically conducted 2009, 2010, 2011. So I got all 12 players, I got them sitting down one-on-one, pretty clear audio, as well as, you know, Mike Krzyzewski, the assistant coach. Unfortunately, Chuck Daly, the head coach, had died. I probably interviewed 60 people, but the brunt of it was the 12 uh, players. Probably two years ago now, a company optioned the book, maybe three years ago, and they were going to make a documentary out of it. Now, there had been one Dream Team documentary. These guys were going to do it a little differently. They were going to base it on my book. And so I hunted down and found these audio tapes. The documentary people were over the moon. I mean, they just thought this was great. First of all, they had the voices of the guys. Kids, it's so hard to get Jordan to do anything now. (laughs) I'd known all these guys for years, but people don't understand how hard it is for them to give up their time. 
here I had them kind of in a historical archival manner. It sounded real. The documentary, like so many things in Hollywood, became topsy-turvy. The first network didn't want to do it. It's just constantly in what they call turnaround. So meanwhile, they weren't doing anything with it. And I had these tapes, myself and my agent, Scott Waxman, thought, why don't we do a podcast on it? And so I had been working on it for a while. The question became when to release it. You know, I'm kind of well known, but it's not like, um, you know, a Michael Jordan documentary or something. Well, then the pandemic hits and the Michael Jordan tapes hit, providing this sort of platform on when to release something that the people over here are nuts. There's no sport. (laughs) So it became a natural thing to say, hey, let's wait till the Jordan thing is over and let's see if anybody's interested. Next thing I know, I had a bunch of iHeart Radio and Braun Razors and a, an insurance company and all these sponsors, not because of the brilliance of the podcast, although I hope they like it, but let's face it, because of the subject matter. I mean, the Dream Team has never really gone out of fashion. It's amazing. It's extraordinary how relevant in the culture these guys still are. Primarily Jordan, Magic, Bird, but they know everybody still. Carl Malone and John Stockton are in the final uh, two episodes all over the place. Uh, Larry Bird runs strongly through it. Magic is in it. These guys are still a big part of the sporting culture. So I hit it kind of actually kind of lucky. It's perfect timing, really. So I appreciate you sharing the information there. I believe the show rocketed to number one straight away in the sports category via a tweet that you put out online pretty recently. So congrats on the success early on. How have you found the podcast being received by your contemporaries or, or those familiar with the Dream Team itself? Well, you have to understand how different podcasting is for me. It's funny that I was in your country. I was in Sydney in 2000 when it sort of hit this thing between, not, not when the internet was invented, but it was exactly at the Sydney Olympics when things changed for me. When we all started to realize that we weren't just Sports Illustrated writing these long magazine pieces anymore, that we had to kind of cater to the internet. And there was one event that happened, Rulon Gardner, this obscure wrestler, and I don't know whether anybody knows who I'm talking about, won the Greco-Roman gold medal, beating this Russian, Alexander Karelin, who had never lost before. I'm thinking, this is a great story for SI. But it happened on a Tuesday which meant that the magazine didn't come out till the following Thursday. So I had to write a quick SI.com piece, an internet piece. And I went to a Rulon Gardner party, which was in front of the Sydney Art Museum. You know, beautiful site. So during the party, all I could write in the internet thing was about Corellin, because I wanted to save all of the Rulon Gardner stuff for the magazine. So during the party, people started passing out copies of the the internet piece. And all it was was a short little thing about Corellin. And they got all mad at me. You know, all the rule on gardeners, where's the stuff about art? You know, I go, well, it's going to be in the magazine seven days later. You know, don't worry. And everybody went, well, what the hell are you talking about? We don't want to wait. We don't want to wait seven days. You know, we read the internet. The immediacy. Literally was at that moment when my life changed and the podcasting thing came along. I don't know how long you've been doing it, but to me, it was new until three, four years ago. And I discovered that I really liked it. It's a good storytelling form. In the early days, you didn't have a video on it. So somebody like me who has a face made for a radio or audio was comfortable doing that. I really got into this. I really enjoyed the whole process of it. I enjoyed going into writing the scripts, going into a studio. And, you know, yeah, everybody's liked it so far. But most of my contemporaries in this business who are younger than me, Zach Lowe, ESPN, Howard Beck from Bleacher Report, everybody has a podcast. (laughs) Woj you know, who breaks every story over here, Chris Mannix from SI. I had been on all their podcasts, so I understood the rhythm of it and the importance of making it personal, you know, that it's got to be a storytelling friendly mechanism, no matter what the subject matter is. So I'd say I really kind of took to it. I hope I get other chances to do it. And my opportunity to do this one, obviously, 
just happened to be based upon the opportune material <laughs> that I had. It wasn't my own abilities as a podcaster. But I, I look forward to it and I had a good time doing it. Yeah, it's great to hear you on the podcast waves and uh, I hope that you do definitely get some other opportunities to do some other interesting and varied topics about different sports and whatnot because clearly you've got a great knowledge of many sports, not just basketball, but primarily we, we know you from basketball in terms of the NBA history side of things for sure. How did you go when you were recording the additional audio that accompanies this podcast? I'm a, a stickler for detail when I do my editing. I, I like to make sure that it comes together pretty nicely. Was your patience tested at all when you were doing the scripting for what you were saying to add the additional audio? The hero of this thing is an Aussie. <laughs> oh, really? Mark Francis, whose father apparently was a famous guy. Do you know the name Francis, who's sort of a radio legend over there? Hmm. You're young. Some of your viewers are going to know him, and I'm trying to think where he was. Okay. Mark's father, I think he's passed, but he was a, a legend in Australia. And Mark got hired by Diversion Podcast, my agent, Scott Waxman, to be the, the producer, to do all the audio stuff. It was two hours ago when I listened to the next episode that's going to go on Monday. And I said, oh, shit, I made a mistake. And it's happened like six or seven times. I mean, it can happen, right? You make a factual error. And if we're talking live, we correct it and everything. But these aren't like that. These are taped. So normally what would have happened with this was that I would go into a studio in New York. I recorded them all in New York, eight episodes. I think we did two at a time, most of the time. So four or five trips to New York, which is fine with me. But then when it was all done, I discovered seven, eight mistakes that I had made. And I could no longer go into the studio in New York. The city's closed down. <laughs> so... Mark and I had a bunch of conversations. I had a microphone that I plug into my phone, a uh, program, and that I record the voice. And Mark has to do the magic of putting it together. And sometimes he says, look, I can't do an Australian accent, but look, look, <laughs> look man, I can't make the game. No, I'm doing British. No. You know, I'm sorry. It doesn't sound the same. Let me just delete it. And most of the time that works. So quite Honestly, the impatient requiring job of production was done primarily by Mark. And when we went into that, that post after we got out, and I got to say with a gentle pat on my back, I was pretty good. I'm not a 17 take guy, that I was pretty good going through that script. And what had helped me was in the last book that I wrote called Golden Days, I did the audio for it. I, I read the entire book. And you want something that's a... Uh, arduous job. It's reading a 95,000 word book. And you really get some training from that. You really understand where you have to breathe. You understand if a word is coming up that you have some trouble with, you got to get prepared for that. You got to cough. You got to lean to the side to take your breath. I would say I did that pretty good. And the book preparation was really important for that. So Mark and I, when we got into that studio, Honestly, as hard work as it is, and you know it is hard work, we had a blast. It was really a lot of fun doing it. Mm, great to hear these uh, recollections, and thanks for sharing them. I, I haven't had a chance to read Golden Days yet. Parallels between, I think, the 1972 Lakers versus the 2017 Golden State Warriors. Kind of a book that runs through the thread of Jerry West. For any of your listeners who don't know, Jerry West is literally the logo of the league, of the NBA, you know, the hunched over dribbler like that. And uh, Jerry has been in the NBA in an active capacity, basically since 1960, his rookie year with the Lakers, their first year in Los Angeles. So for a variety of reasons, so much of the history of the NBA passes through Jerry West. Transformation to the West Coast, the Boston Celtics dynasty that the Lakers always lost to, Jerry West finally breaking through, Jerry West becoming a coach. Jerry West becoming a general manager who puts together the Magic, Kareem, Worthy, uh, Byron Scott, Showtime Lakers. Then the Jerry West who puts together the Shaq and Kobe Lakers. Then the Jerry West who goes to Golden State as an executive and helps put together, I don't want to overemphasize, helps put together the Curry, uh, Draymond Green, Durant eventually, Warriors that kind of dominate along with LeBron. 
So all this history had passed through Jerry West, and I was kind of trying to do a link the past of Jerry West and the present NBA, sometimes successfully. But if anybody reads the book, the strength of the book is this character of Jerry West, who there is literally no one like him. I mean, he's been involved in the league for 60 years, for over 60 years, has been with a team. There was a couple of years he was out between coaching and becoming a general manager, but not many. And anybody's still active in the game and still keep up with it. I know there was a legendary Australian coach they called Father, you know, who was Andrew Gaze's father, right? Yeah, Lindsay. That's right. Yeah, yeah. That he was a legendary sort of, they call him Father, right? He's basically the, the father of Australian hoops. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So Jerry doesn't have that because, you know, he didn't bring the game. But Jerry was there when it got popularized, as I said, when it went to the West Coast when the Lakers were the first team to kind of turn the, their franchise into a showpiece. They built the forum. They had movie stars. And Jerry was a part of all that, stayed a part of it through all these changes, free agency, expansion, and then got to the Lakers, who were kind of the first Silicon Valley team. So he has passed through so many things. So the book is about that and Jerry West part and all that. Mm, a number of books that are on my list that I need to uh, add to my collection, but that's certainly one of them as well. One of the ones I, I have it's, uh, on Kindle, but I have got it, is uh, Unfinished Business, which is your season inside the Boston Celtics back in 1991 towards the tail end of Larry Bird's career. Uh, that's a fascinating insight into the behind the scenes of a team going through a big change from being the dominant team of the 1980s or one of with the Lakers. How did you enjoy that experience being ingrained with that Celtics franchise and and being so close to Bird over that period of time in that season ahead of the 1992 uh, Barcelona games. Right. I didn't know that at the time. It was the 1991 season. I was talking about the internet before. That was kind of the first of those inside books I did. And you'd get to the end of the season. There wasn't an internet. There was not a sportsillustrated.com. And the magazine came out once a week and there wasn't Twitter where you gave your opinions. There wasn't a podcast where you went on and gave your opinions. I basically wrote one story per week, and I didn't even do that sometimes. Sometimes there wasn't a basketball story in. So you would go and do a story and spend three or four or five days with a team. You'd have all this extra material, all this funny stuff. And, you know, the magazine, unlike the Internet, is a finite piece of material that if somebody tells me, hey, you got a thousand words, that's all. You know, you don't have 3,000 words. So I would get to the end of the season and I would just have all this stuff that I could never get in anywhere. There wasn't really a a platform to do it. Even a daily newspaper is this small and even the guys covering daily can't find a place to put everything. So I just thought it would be fun to be able to really get it and expand. And the team I happened to pick, well, I didn't happen to, it was very specific, was the Celtics for one of the reasons you said they had Bird, who was one of the enduring interesting characters ever, you know, in any sport, who was kind of getting near the end. I knew the coach, Chris Ford, who I had played high school basketball against. Okay. And I had held him, I think I looked up a box score that he he had 38 and I had seven in a game. So when (laughs) I say I played against him, we were on the court together. And Boston was reasonably near, I mean, it was a pragmatic decision. I I didn't want to do the Lakers because I would have had to fly to Los Angeles and you only get a certain amount of money to do a book. Mm-hmm. You get an advance and they're not giving you travel money. It's not like Sports Illustrated. <laughs> so that was a pragmatic decision. And the Celtics were a little bit kind of media friendly. I mean, Bird, Larry could be a grouchy pain in the ass, but Kevin McHale was a great, great and funny guy. One of the funniest guys ever. Danny Ainge was still there. Danny was a funny guy. The assistant coaches... They had a guy named Don Casey, who Mm -hmm. was one of the all-time funny guys. So it was just a great place to plug in. And it was a very decisive line type in the NBA. Right around that season, teams were starting to charter. I'm trying to think who the first one was. Probably the Bulls because of Michael. You couldn't run Michael Jordan through an airport. It, It was literally like trying to get the president through the airport. So you used to be able to travel with these guys. You could get your whole story done going on a plane with the guys, and they, they liked it, okay? They would talk to you on the plane because they didn't have anything to do but sleep. 
it's not exactly like they were sitting down to read that year's Nobel Prize winning novel. <laughs> you know, that wasn't happening. <laughs> so, so the Celtics were still taking non-charter flights. More importantly, they were still busing and I could still get myself on the team bus. And so much of the book was sitting there in the middle of the bus. Have you ever ridden on a team bus? I'm sure it's the same way in Australia. Players are in the back. The niggling, who are they people, are kind of in the middle, like me. The coach is in the front seat on the right. You know, the assistant coaches take the two over here. There was a lot of fly on the wall stuff. And I discovered very early that there was no need to tell a game story unless it was incredible game. And for some reason, an incredible performance. And if that was the case, then you take that apart. Then you really analyze the heck out of that to see what's going on. And if it isn't, forget about it. <laughs> you know? mm. Just another game. Another thing for young sports writers out there is that the most important people a lot of time on a professional team are the assistant coaches because they want to be your friend because they want to become head coaches. And the guys that are the seventh and eighth players on the team because they want you to tell people they should be the fourth or fifth guy on the team. You got to pick your spots with Larry. It's not like I hung out with Larry all the time. It's not like every day I was pestering him. You got to wait for your spot. And with Larry, it was on the road. I remember we were in Phoenix. And for some reason, Larry was in a good mood. I can't even really remember why. And I bet on the Phoenix trip, I must have spent four hours around him. And when he was back in Boston, where he has his own family, he has his own pressures, all that kind of thing, I don't think I messed with him more than an hour. So when you do these things, you got to understand the rhythm of the team. I think I really got good guidance from doing that Celtics book. And later, when I did the same kind of book about the Phoenix Suns, I was even luckier. You know, I got more inside. That's very important, reading the team and reading the players. And that's seven seconds or less where you were basically spending a season there with Mike D'Antoni and the, the Phoenix Suns. Yeah, and once again, it was kind of lucky. I picked the Suns. I didn't know anybody. This was 05, 06 season. Mike had gotten there the season before, and Steve Nash had gotten there the season before. I knew Steve. I didn't even really know Mike that well. I think I had done one story. I knew Alvin Gentry, who was one of the assistants. But I didn't really know anybody else, but I knew the PR person very well, a woman named Julie Fye, who's one of the five greatest PR directors there ever was. So I call up Julie and I said, hey, I want to do a story where I spend a week as the assistant coach in preseason, just for Sports Illustrated. I want them to let me in on meetings, let me in in practices. Once again, it was this incredible luck, like Mike D'Antoni friendliest guy in the world. His answer was, yeah, what the hell? <laughs> you know, I don't even know whether he talked it over with anybody. <laughs> the assistant coaches, Alvin Gentry, Mark Ivoroni, Phil Weber, and Dan, Mike's brother, Dan, had come in that year. Yeah, why not? Steve Nash was a friendly guy, although I don't think Mike ran it by the team. He trusted Julie that I was an okay guy, that I had been around for years, although I wasn't a homer. I also wasn't the kind of guy that if somebody told me something off the record, I would honor that. So I went out to Phoenix and I did this story on being with them for training camp. And I wrote it for Sports Illustrated. And people, they just loved it. I mean, once in a while, it just works. They loved this story. Hundreds of people. And even the stuff in it that semi-embarrassed the sons, that they said some stuff they wish they hadn't. Even they said, this is just a lot of fun. They were a team on the rise. They wanted their story told. They were trying to make their bones. You know, they weren't the Spurs. I knew Greg Popovich very well. But if I would have suggested it to Popovich, he wouldn't give me an hour with the team. I wrote the story and people liked it so much. And I was so stupid, I never thought anything about it. And my <laughs> agent calls me up and says, wait a minute, you had all this access. Why don't you see if you can do a book? <laughs> you know, so... I called Dan Tony back, not knowing honestly what he would say. I really didn't. And I said, Mike, this thing was really popular. People loved this story. They thought you were funny. They thought the assistants were funny. They loved the interchange. What if I spend a season with you? And if you don't really want to tell me something 
you got to know me well enough that I would shield you from that. Mike's answer? Yeah, come on out. <laughs> <laughs> and I went to the banquet the first night before their first before their first game. There was a little bit of a break in there. They had a banquet. I went to this and I told Mike, don't forget to tell the team. You know, I had introduced myself to most of them by then, but make sure they know what I'm doing. <laughs> so Mike gets to the end of the dinner and he forgets all about me. You know, they were ready to break up. I go, Mike, you know, could you? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Jack, you remember Jack from the preseason? He's here. He's, he's going to do a book or something. Yeah. Just talk to him. So, all right, <laughs> we'll see you guys tomorrow. <laughs> and I bet you there wasn't 10 times during the year. Mike would say to me, I'd prefer if you didn't write that. Mm. And sometimes I would weigh that. And if circumstances became later that it was okay, I would write it. And sometimes about five times he would say to me, if you write that, I'll kill you. <laughs> and that I would keep off the record. And the book came out and there was some stuff about Sean Marion that he didn't love. And Mike was embarrassed about a couple things. But I remember I, right around that time, I went to a book signing in Phoenix. And again, not because the book was that great, but because here's a book about the Phoenix Suns. You know, it's not a book about the Knicks. Here's our sons. And I show up at this book signing and, you know, there were hundreds of people there because they were Suns fans. And Alvin Gentry and Phil Weber and Mark Ivoroni, who were the assistant coaches, showed up. Wow. That's great. Mike didn't. Because there was some stories in the paper. They were a little embarrassed about this. But, you know, I thought that was like really classy move. I never forgot th that they did that. When I say there was something negative in that book or that Sean Marion was a little mad, people are astounded it, for the most part. Some people that read it carefully, maybe you had a different impression. But people just got the kind of spirit of it, that they understood there's moments with a team when things aren't great. But overall, I think the Phoenix Suns and anybody that took anything negative from it, I would be amazed if they didn't all say, hey, this really helped define us in NBA history. It just was like a moment in time again that I was lucky. Great support there from the Phoenix assistants too to, to be there on hand for one of your signings when you turned up as well. Uh, but it looks like the, the Phoenix, for the most part, over the course of their franchise history, the fan base has always been really into their sons. I can remember back in the 1976 finals when they got back home to Phoenix, the crowd there just waiting for them at the airport was just incredible. So it's been going back for decades that they have a really special bond with their fan base. They're one of the long time franchises of the NBA. Jerry Colangelo has been with them for uh, not now, but decades and decades. And there's a, a few teams like that trying to think who else is in that kind of category. The Milwaukee Bucks, maybe, that have been such a loyal and big part of this league, but never had Magic, never had Bird, never had Michael, never won at all, never got the attention. And those kind of teams, when you can latch on to them, uh, the Spurs, although they were an ABA team, were kind of that team until they got Pop and they got Tim Duncan, who put a cone of silence if there's one regret I have, I have a couple of regrets, the Spurs and inside that organization and inside Popovich's mind, that would have been one of the really great, great books to do. I would have loved to have done that, but that never worked. You started working for SI back in early 1980s and you became the chief writer of the NBA, I think around 1985. What comes to mind when you think back to those early years when you were covering Iconic teams and players of the 1980s that we've already mentioned, you know, Magic, Bird, the injury of Jordan and whatnot. What, what brings to mind for you, Jack? Here was the thing about the NBA then. It was the third sport in American culture. And let's say the early 80s. I'm not going to say 85. By then, Michael's in the league. Mm -hmm. Larry and Magic have been in the league five years. I don't think your viewers would understand how low the NBA was. I mean, it was the third sport in American culture, but at Sports Illustrated, it was the fifth. Baseball was really big. Pro football, college football, pro football, baseball, college basketball, NBA came fifth. So when I took over the B, it wasn't like, hey, let's get the great Jack McCallum to cover. We really need him. It was sort of like, eh, Jack's pretty good. <laughs> let's give it to Jack. So when I got the job, it was Michael's second year but he got hurt right away. 
And at the end of it is when he returns and goes for 49 and 63 in both the guard. <laughs> who does that? Against the Celtics, who, by the way, were the champions that year and one of the great Boston Celtics teams there ever was. Anyway, so I got on this elevator that was on the second floor, and it just started going like this. And the people that were lucky enough to be covering it, and there was me for a magazine, and there was a bunch of great newspaper men, Bob Ryan, a bunch of people that were around, Jan Hubbard, the guys and Mark Heisler out in LA, great guys in Houston, Fran Blindberry. There were like 15 of us that got on this elevator. The strange thing is, as stupid as we were, we all sort of understood this. It's very rare when you see something in the moment. We all could see where this was going. You could see it. You could see what Jordan was doing. You could see the the blueprint that had been laid by Magic and Larry. You could see this happening, 85, 86, 87. International travel came in. I went to Moscow with the Atlanta Hawks. Ted Turner brought in. Now around 88, 89, Boris Stankovic, the great head of FIBA, starts floating this idea that NBA players should play in the Olympics. One of the great myths is that it was an American idea, that it was David Stern's idea. It was not, not in any way, shape, or form. Stern was still trying to manage this thing that had been down here when he became commissioner that was starting to go like this. There were TV deals all over the place. Stern would make a TV deal with somebody in Italy in 1983, and, oh, wait, the contract ran out. There was a lot of by the scruff of your feet type of thing that Stern did. But like I said, we could see this thing rising. And when finally the Dream Team was announced, by then, it still wasn't a big deal when it was first announced in the NBA because in the States, because really nobody exactly thought who was going to play. Once again, there was no internet, there was no social media. So it wasn't written every day. If you announced now there was a Dream Team, within an hour, every person with a laptop would have <laughs> named their Dream Team players. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. It would have been insane. <laughs> but there wasn't, there wasn't that kind of talk to the point that in 1990, the end of the year, I remember saying to my editors, look, I don't know who's going to play yet. They're not making a big deal out of it, but they haven't named a coach yet. I think I should do some story, hypothetically, picking my five guys. We can put them on the cover of Sports Illustrated, take a picture of them at the All-Star break. So it took me a month to arrange this. I went to Magic. Hey, well, I'm not going to do it unless Larry says he's going to do it. Well, Larry told me he's not going to play because his back is too bad. I had to go through the usual negotiations to get Jordan to say yes. I picked Barkley. He said, sure. I picked Carl Malone. He said, sure. And for some reason, I picked Ewing over David Robinson. I can't remember. Anyway, we shot these guys at the All-Star game. This is in Charlotte in 1991. Mm -hmm. I swear until then, there was not that much talk about the Dream Team. There really wasn't. It's a peculiar thing. Chuck Daly was named coach on Valentine's Day, 1991. I can't even honestly remember whether that was before the All-Star game or not. I, I just, I can't remember. It was right around that time. So they didn't have a coach, you know, and they hadn't yet resolved how many college players were going to be on it because of this tradition of having college players. So I wrote this story. We took a photograph of these guys in Charlotte and we got these five guys in a room together I'm telling you, I, I just never saw anything like it when people realized, wait, they were funneling these five boys together. Wait, this is the Olympic team? Well, what? It was pandemonium. There were people <laughs> knocking on the door to get in. It was insane. So we took this picture. I still remember I was able to get my sons in there. And my kids then were like 14 and 11. Oh, wow. And they played basketball. And I mean, that's huge. You know, I was father of the year there. <laughs> For some reason, we decided that Michael Jordan needed a swag bag. You know, I mean, Coles to Newcastle, right? So we took this picture and I wrote a story that week. And in the first paragraph of the story, I used the word dream twice. I said it was a star spangled dream. How likely is this dream to come true? Something like very likely. And some editor put the word dream team on the cover. I honestly could never find out who. I did not put the two words dream team together. <laughs> I used the word dream. And I was in cover shoots many times when you look at the cover and 
somebody says, out to lunch, and somebody else goes, no way. Or, you know, it's kind of a communal thing, the way they pick the headline things. And I could never find out exactly who said it because I never wanted to take exact credit for it, although I'm willing to take partial credit. (laughs) So this story comes out. It's got the five guys with the Olympic rings, dream team, at a time when Sports Illustrated was very important. You know, it was in its absolute prime. I'm not saying that. Well, I am saying it wasn't because of me. All of a sudden, the dream team was like a thing. It was like, we had something to hang our hats on. We began talking about, hey, is Jordan really going to play? You know, is Larry's Burt back too bad? Is Charles Barkley, who was getting in all this trouble at the time, is Charles going to be able to play? Um, And it became a thing from then on in. But it really wasn't much of a thing until early in 1991. Once again, you got back to that, but the story you asked me about riding this elevator, we didn't see the culmination of the dream team. But we could see this thing getting bigger. And we really liked the idea that we had started covering this sport that white, rich America had turned its back on in the 70s and early 80s. And now they couldn't spend enough money to wrap their arms around two black athletes like Magic Johnson and Michael Jordan. They couldn't, they couldn't get enough of it. <laughs> we were on that trip with them. That's one of the really fortunate things in my career, obviously. And I didn't get the gig because I was so good. I'd like to think I did a good job with it, but that wasn't the reason that I got it. No, you did a great job with it. It's just great to hear you reminisce about this and, and talk about how some of these things came to be. So I appreciate you sharing these stories, Jack. But it was massive even back in 1992 here in Australia. I remember my brother and I, we had Olympic t-shirts. Like there was a t-shirt of that photo you're talking about, that famous one with the Olympic rings. And then it had the five players and it said Lords of the Ring, I think is how it read on the t-shirt. So and we had that back here in Australia in 1992 when basketball was really how taking old were you off. Then? I was 17 in 1992, so a few years older than your kids. I can imagine that would have been an amazing experience for them to be in there at that photo shoot to see those players. They had a qualifying tournament in in Portland. They had to qualify for the Olympics, which sounds amazing, but, Mm. you know, they had had the bronze medal in 88 in Seoul when the last college team. So they had to qualify. So it's a whole long story. It's episode five of the podcast, Portland, and it's a big chapter in the book. But the Tournament of the Americas. Yeah, the Tournament of the Americas, which was renamed, by the way. The qualifying for the Olympics was supposed to take place in March, you know, or April. The NBA is getting toward the playoffs. So the NBA bought the tournament. I think a guy from Brazil had the television rights to it. And, you know, David Stern said, how much? (laughs) I think they paid three or four million bucks and they moved it to, I think it was in July, where the finals had been that year. And so Portland was a great town. My wife and kids came with me to Portland, got them tickets to the game. And uh, I've written this in the book and I said it a hundred times on interviews and stuff. There was really nothing like Portland. As I put it in the book, it was the last time you felt you could really wrap your arms around the team. Portland was a mid-sized city. It wasn't Los Angeles. Nobody got lost. And the first time they were going to run out together, even for a hard-boiled, unsentimental veteran like me, that was going to be cool. <laughs> you know, who's going to be leading? Who's going to be in the first starting team? What are they going to look like? This is this is cool. So when they ran out, predictably Magic had the flag. Larry was behind him. And they run out, and the Cuban team stops practicing. <laughs> <laughs> they stop. That says it all. They halted their warm-up <laughs> and went down and watched the two-lane warm-up drill. I'll just never forget that. So it was at that point, I think I wrote, that it sort of wasn't like a, a competition anymore. It wasn't exactly like a play because it wasn't scripted, but it was like a, a production that was going to be all improvisation, that we kind of had this general storyline, but within it all this stuff could happen. But the characters who were the Stooges, the other team, Mm-hmm. understood their roles. They understood they had to kind of try to play their asses off, but why are we bothering? And the American teams had to play their kind of role as being semi-ambassadors, but we're still going to kick your ass. We're still going to show you how to play this game. And it continued that way all the way through the Olympics. And from what I remember, one of the teams, 
that kind of had this FU a little bit was Australia, that they kind of said they were a little bit, and I'm saying this in a good way, a little less friendly. You know, you're tough. It's a tough culture. It's mm. a, it's our culture in a way. It's the same language and things like that. And hey, F you, we're not here to play Patsy. We're probably <laughs> going to lose. We're probably going to lose. <laughs> but you know, they had some reaction to Magic yeah, playing. The team doctor had some reaction. So the Aussies kind of took on, if there was a bad role, the Aussies in the minds of the Americans took it on a little bit, right? Mm. I don't know whether you'd agree with that. I do agree. Yeah, absolutely. I didn't like their their view on on magic, but I like the idea that they weren't going in with uh, <laughs> hands up. It was like the you know the end of Breaker Marab. We're marching off to our death, but screw you. You know we're <laughs> we're going to go with with hands held high. But I don't remember who was on that team. Was was Andrew on that team? Andrew was on that team. That was one of the five Olympics that he played in. One of the elder statesmen of the Australian team, Phil Smythe was his name. Yeah, I remember that. I remember him, yeah. He was the guy that was probably most against wanting to play against Magic back at that time. I guess a majority of people's opinions back then about the HIV virus and whatnot were probably not nearly as developed as they are now, but he was one of the main guys that was against it. How did they do it? They ended up not playing. They didn't cross over in 1992. I think Australia ended up sixth, but um, it was 1996 when they ended up playing against, I guess, Dream Team 3, you'd call them. That, that's when they actually had that pre Olympic exhibition match in uh, Salt Lake City where Shane Heal from Australia had that run in with Charles Barkley right. where they had a bit of a push and shove in the exhibition game. So they did play in the 96 Olympics uh, in Atlanta. Each year it got subsequently closer, ending up in 2004 with the utter disaster of meeting Cuba in the first game and Cuba beat the Americans by 19. It was at that point that it had been the furthest incarnation from the dream team that the USA basketball and the NBA got together and said, hey, look, we're either doing this right. It was still NBA players, but I mean, they had Allen Iverson and, and Stefan Marbury as the defensive stalwarts in the back. I mean, you and I get 11 and nine against, you know, Iverson and Marbury by this time. So that's when Krzyzewski took over. Gary Colangelo took over the chairmanship and they returned it to being a serious thing. And I've always said that the team in 08 and and 2012 accomplished basketball wise much more than the dream team did because that was a young team you know lebron carmelo kobe wasn't so young by then and by then they're playing nba players i mm. mean by then spain is really good yeah spain is yeah. a really good team france is a really good team and what that team accomplished in 08 and 12 was really something winning it subsequently is is just not going to be easy. But in 92, the only possible competition they could get would be from the Soviet bloc teams, which was either Lithuania, which had Marshall Onis and Sabonis, who by then were qualified NBA players, or uh, Croatia, which had Tony Kukoc and the great late Drazen Petrovic. But they were good teams. The dream team was perfectly built. They had five or six or seven guys at the absolute apex of their careers. They had Bird and Magic, who were the absolute perfect ceremonial players. They had two centers who could dominate at a time when seven-foot centers, other places, were still a little bit of the stiff guys. There wasn't Dirk Nowitzki shooting 25-footers and being seven-foot. Yep. They, they had a really perfect team. People forget how lucky they were to have gotten Jordan, Barkley, Pippen, Drexler, Ewing. They were absolutely at the perfect spot of their careers. Malone and Stockton were still good six years later. And Mullen, Chris Mullen, was at the apex of his career. So all those guys were perfectly placed to be really good. And they had enough maturity that when Charles would go off half cock, they would kind of <laughs> be able to knock him down. And they were so good defensively. Chuck Daly used to say they'd be trying to figure out who to start. And part of it would be politics, you know, wait a minute. Drexler didn't start last game. He hasn't played enough. And Chuck used to go out of the meeting and just say, give me Jordan and Pippen, and, and I don't care. Because <laughs> Jordan and Pippen could shut anybody down. So if there was a night when the jump shots weren't falling or the whistles were being blown the wrong way or Charles had stayed out too late or Carl Malone got in foul trouble it didn't, or Larry couldn't play at all, it didn't matter because Jordan and Pippen 
And David Robinson, when he was the center, would just stop you know, any kind of rally or anything that might be happening. As we record this chat today, the ESPN docuseries, the 10-part series, The Last Dance, concluded just this week. Of the many things that I, I loved about it, director Jason Hare, his decision to, to give Jordan an iPad or like a tablet to watch pivotal moments and then capture his reactions. I think that was a masterstroke to, to get that on camera. You've been doing recaps of The Last Dance for SI.com. And they've been a great read as well. What's your overarching opinion of the series and, and what you took in from that and learned from that most, Jack? I took a lot more from it than I thought. First of all, uh, the dirty little secret was I had the episodes, as did not just me, but the people that were going to review it, they gave it to us early mm. because I used to put it out at 11 o'clock p.m. And the thing had ended at 10.59. <laughs> and somebody called me and goes, you're not that fast. <laughs> and so what would happen was that I would get them by Tuesday. And we have a pandemic going on. My wife and I are social distancing. I had nothing else to do. <laughs> I mean, I looked at these things. I went through these things, you know, two or three times, stopped it. So I had a lot of time and a lot of space to reflect. So that's number one. I had a lot of time to digest this, as did some other people. Number two, I had endless space in Sports Illustrated. They said, people love this, man. People love this documentary. Just write it. Have at you it. Know, just go ahead. Have at it. Number three was that the last three years of Michael's three-peat, I had actually not covered the league because Jordan retired for the first time after 93. Bird retired after the Dream Team. Magic retired, unretired, then retired again. And so around that time, I had said, the league isn't the same to me anymore. I want to come back to it, but give me a few years off. So I went and became an editor at SI and did some other things. So I didn't come back to the league until Kobe Shaq, the three-peat in 2000. So I missed, as a reporter, those three years of the Jordan second three-peat. Mm -hmm. So there were a lot of things that I didn't remember. I had tweeted humorously. I said, from now on, anytime anybody wants to ask me anything, I'm going to tell my kids to hand it to me on a laptop and I'm going to look at it and then kind of laugh at it super silliously and go, yeah, right. You know, because Jordan's tone on that was beyond. The funniest one was the Gary Payton one. Oh, hilarious. What Gary Payton said about stopping him and Jordan just hands the laptop back and goes, huh, the glove. <laughs> I had no problem with the glove. <laughs> I still laugh at that. So number four, what I got out of it was a lot of things. But it was interesting to me to see how different the game was played. I mean, this was the 90s, and there was a game in the 98 finals when the Utah Jazz, who had one of the most functioning offenses in history, John Stockton and Malone running a pick and roll, and Stockton and Malone running a break, they scored 54 points. Incredible. Yeah. Game three. Yeah, and the games were in the 80s routinely. They had Michael Jordan, Scottie Pippen out on the floor, Reggie Miller over on, on this side, Chris Mullen, Jalen Rose, and the games were in the 80s. So what it said to me was, I'm a victim of my time anyway. Like I would always say Jordan was the greatest player, even though I would totally accept someone saying LeBron. But the game was played on a space of retail space like this wide. And the game now is played like this. And if Jordan had that kind of space, I, I, I just don't know how many points he would have had. And one of the great quotes to me came from Rodman, who had played with the bad boy Pistons. And Rodman says very seriously, Rodman's not a suck up. I don't even think he's close to Michael anymore. Rodman said something like, for Jordan, what he went through physically against the Pistons, you know, in the early years when he was getting his ass handed to him. Then to go through that with the Knicks, you know, yeah. again, to get to the finals, and then to go through it with those Jazz and Pacers team, he said, there's nobody, nobody who could have done that. That was kind of the message to me, the difference in the way the game was played and what Jordan had to do to get himself to the basket make those shots, complete the play, and then later on figure out how to do it as a more perimeter player, all the while 
with nobody taking many three-point shots. It's extraordinary how different that the particulars of the game are the same, same dimensions, five players on a team, same rules except for hand-checking, and how different the game is now. Were you surprised at all by the absence of anyone in particular not appearing on camera in terms of the interviewing? Jack McCallum, for one. I'm glad you mentioned that because I believe I heard on some podcast that you appeared on, you were apparently scheduled to get interviewed, but Justin Timberlake, of all people, may have led to your <laughs> your not appearing on the show. Is that correct? I was scheduled several times. Uh, the producer, Mike Tolan, great guy, he's a friend of mine, and I have like 25 emails of trying to schedule me. One time I was in New York, and my joke was they said, hey, Jack, we're really sorry, man. JT just flew in, and we got to interview JT. And I'm thinking, wow, James Taylor's in this thing? Like, that's amazing. I love that guy's music, man. I saw him back in 69 in a club in New York. And no, Justin Timberlake. So I got pushed out once for him. A couple other things happened. So I jokingly made a comment in the first blog because I felt I had to address it. Mm -hmm. And Mike Tolan called me up and said, hey, I really enjoyed your blog. But I thought that was kind of, what was the word he used? Underhanded to write that paragraph that we didn't interview you after having you scheduled. I said, Mike, I did it only because in my world, a hundred people have asked me about it. Can't wait to see you on the Dream Team. What episode are you in? Can't wait to hear what you say. So I said, I live in my world, man. I got to address it. I'm sorry. And I'm going to address it in a joking manner. Mike understood when I put it that way, because it was going to be a big enough event. But beside that, not who was absent. I thought that Jordan's sons really livened up that last episode. They were on camera and they were young and they were vibrant and they had something to say. And I really felt they sparked the whole thing up. And I just wanted more of them. And I know, Michael, I'm sure shut it down. I understand I don't want my family involved. But Michael went into great depth about his own father, which he should have. And he went into great depth about his relationship with his security guard, another father figure. I think Michael should have showed something about him being a father, particularly since it was a bunch of men who were interviewed. And every time Mrs. Jordan came on, she enlivened the thing. So they needed a few more, I thought, family touches, particularly his kids. That was my opinion. I agree wholeheartedly. I think the kids got short shrift. I think they had Marcus, Jeffrey, and uh, Jasmine appearing for maybe not even a minute total across 10 episodes. They were so animated. They looked like they had been released. <laughs> they looked like they had been held in the garage. We've at last opened the door. We're going to get on camera, you know? I'm sure they just had so much more to say. I understand protecting your family, but since Michael went into such great detail about not only his father, but the other guy that he had a father relationship with, all of which is totally valid. I just thought that underscores the point that you could show yourself being a father. But I'll tell you what about Michael. I knew it beforehand. Now I know it more. You're not talking him in anything he doesn't want to do. <laughs> <laughs> that's not how he operates. <laughs> not how he operates. Yeah. Yeah. That's just some iconic uh, one liners that he came out with and, and his facial expressions as he reacted to some of these things that he was being shown. I think they really added to the overall impact of the series. It would have been great to have you on there, particularly, obviously, chatting about the Dream Team. But there were bigger losses. You know, I would have liked to heard from Craig Hodges, yes, who was a great yeah. teammate of his, who had gone to the White House in a dashiki yes. when Michael yes. didn't show up. You know, another friend of his, she didn't make a big deal out of it, but Robin Roberts, the Good Morning host, who's a very major African-American culture figure in, in America. She either wasn't interviewed or was interviewed and didn't make the cut. So there were people more serious than, than me. And at the end of it, maybe it's a rationalization, but I was kind of glad that I had no part in it and therefore was able to say whatever I wanted to say about the 10 hours of it. Although I was mostly positive, I, I certainly wasn't going to get any kind of vendetta because I wasn't in it. And I, I thought it was masterful. And 10 hours of somebody, there's going to be some complaints about it. There's going to be some things that they didn't get exactly right. But overall, I watched that thing for 10 hours. And I know a lot of people that built their Sundays around it. And that really says something. 
on the back of what you just said there, in your recap of episodes 9 and 10 of The Last Dance on SI.com, you write about a, a younger friend of yours, and I'll just quickly quote you, quote, he and several friends would discuss via Zoom what they expected to see, then watch, then reconvene. The Last Dance became a ritual, a meeting place for a society that, to a large extent, wasn't going anywhere, uh, end quote. So I found that just to be perfect and, and also that matches what's been happening here for me in Australia and countless others I'm sure. Uh, I've met a new group of friends over this last four or five weeks via Zoom doing exactly that where we actually break down the episodes uh, that I've just watched so I think that was really well said in your most recent recap. My, I had a knee replacement. It happened to be my physical therapist. Okay. You guys are the target age there but not to make too fine a point of it but that's kind of what sports is supposed to do. That It's supposed to you know, be this unifying thing to bring us together. And if it brings us together and half the people say Michael Jordan's an asshole and half the people say he's the greatest thing ever, that's still okay. We were together in this kind of laboratory, in this kind of place where we were all commenting on the same thing. One of the other great quotes I got in there, I called up Michael's teammate, Scott Williams, an obscure guy from the first three-peat. And Scott, Scott, who's an enthusiastic, I mean, Scott lived this. Scott lived the first three-peat. He was one of the guys that Jordan used to torture in the bus, in the card games. And Scott goes, hey, man, I built my whole Sunday around it. I, I'd get up. I'd wait for the time. I'd call up Magianas. Am I going to get chicken piccata or am I going to get chicken marsala? You know, my whole day was built around it. And I thought, okay. There's some people like my wife that would say, well, that's pretty freaking silly. <laughs> and I might say that now also at my age, but I get it. You no, know, I really, really do get it. I'm kind of plugging into that pandemic atmosphere here with the podcast. And if it's successful on a minor scale, you know, I'm happy that that's another one of the things that's going to be doing. Half the people will go, oh, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about or... <laughs> He forgot this guy or what's he talking about this for? I don't like his voice or I can't hear this. And half of the other people are going to be going, this is really cool. Yeah, I remember this, you know, this appeals to me. And that's one of the things sports is, is supposed to do. I have a question shortly that is based on an article that I came across while researching for our chat today uh, from one of my other favorite authors, Jeff Perlman, who wrote about you. I mentioned Jeff now because I'm fascinated by the lengths that he goes to when he researches for his books. One of my favorite books is Showtime that he wrote about the 1980s Lakers. I'm curious. Making when, a movie out of it. Yeah, true. That's right. It's been an option to be yeah. a, a series. Yeah. I'm curious, when you start a book project, how do you approach the research phase? What comes to mind when you first narrow down on a topic and where do you go in terms of how you go about researching and what you want to research? The first thing to me is, and I swear I'm, I'm not going to make this up. 90% of my angst, 90% of my worry, 90% of my preparation is to how am I going to get the main people into an environment where they'll talk to me one-on-one -on -one without anybody else around. That's just how it is with me. I'm not saying writing comes easy, but when I have all my stuff done, I, I devote 10% of my worry to writing it. I know if I get these guys, I know if they're sitting down in front of me, okay, I got them. <laughs> if, I, if I got them sitting across from me and nobody's around and the TV's not on, that's the first thing I think of. And particularly with a book like Dream Team, when the number one thing was going to be 11 of the most famous guys in the world, plus Christian Leitner, who turned out, by the way, to be as big a pain in the ass as anybody to get a hold of. But how am I going to get these guys in a place to talk to me. That's number one. Number two, I was lucky with Dream Team because back in the pre-social media era, there were no tweets about Charles Barkley. I hadn't written anything between the weeks that Sports Illustrated came out. There weren't a lot of niche publications. There, there wasn't an internet. So it wasn't covered massively. The first thing I did for the Dream Team was get every Sports Illustrated I ever wrote a story about them, extract everything from it go back and extract everything from newspapers that were in it. If I was doing the same thing now, it would be different because if somebody writes something, reviews a book I did or does an interview with me or something like that, I don't even save it anymore because I figure I can Google it. And I think we've lost something that I assume too much that I'm going to be able to find it. 
And although Google's the greatest thing ever invented, I'm not sure that my research is as diligent as it could have been for the Golden Days book I was talking about. My most fun time doing that, beside talking to Jerry, was going to this library in Los Angeles. I can't remember what it's called. It's got all the Olympic things in it. And spending hours with the old Los Angeles Times of back from 1970, 71. So bottom line is you got to read everything and you got to decide very carefully what you took from somebody else. I have a file that says this came from somebody else and what you got yourself. Somebody had a great definition of plagiarism, which was if you take 500 words from one source, you're plagiarizing. If you take one sentence from 500 sources, you're doing research, you know, and you always got to be careful. If somebody writes something profound or distinct, you have to be very careful to credit them. That's theirs. That's not yours. But if somebody wrote something that is in the common, that we should know it, that the Lakers in 1972 beat the Philadelphia Warriors and Jerry West had this many points. That's in the province of general knowledge. So I'm very careful to say what I got from research and what I did. You have to be careful not to outsmart yourself. I thought the Suns book, maybe I outsmarted myself a little bit by beginning with the playoffs when I could have just begun with day one of the training camp. People like the book, but so much had happened during the playoffs. They had had a seven-game series with the Lakers. They had had a seven-game series with the Clippers. They had had a six-game series with the Mavericks when they lost. That's 20 games that were all eventful and all had something. And I got kind of overwhelmed by how important those games were. So I guess I'm not giving you a clear answer, but try to get people to talk to you when they don't have anything else on their mind. Research everything. Make sure you give credit where credit uh, is due. But To me, there's nothing more important than having those voices talking to you when they don't have anything else on their mind. And once again, you got to get lucky. I I visited these guys 18, 19 years after the Dream Team. They were ready to talk about it. It was an important part of their life. All of them, all of them felt it was a seminal experience. So you got to have some luck. You got to have some luck when you're doing this stuff too. Thank you for elaborating. And and as you said, getting the people in the right place to talk, the audio that you've got in the Dream Team tapes, it's just fascinating to hear them talking and it's just you and them, you're in different scenarios. I think you're in a car driving with Stockton at the time when you're chatting to John. I listened to the tapes back again and because I didn't know what the word podcast was. I didn't know what I'd be doing with these outside of writing this book. Mm. Uh, a couple of times I would be replaying my tapes and I'd hear myself laugh or I'd interrupt them. I go, what? Will you shut up? Why didn't I just let it go on? And there's stuff I left out of the podcast because my stupid voice is in the middle of it. And my Australian genius producer really couldn't do anything to untangle it. (laughs) And I missed nine or 10 things that would be different, but all in all, you know, I got what I wanted and some of the rough audio in it my rationalization anyway is this is just adding to the authenticity of it. That's my, that's my kind of, uh, that's the way I'm rationalizing it. You know, I was going to say something very similar. I think that just adds to its appeal to hear that it's not crystal clear. It just makes it sound even more um, authentic. Now, it'd be remiss of me not to mention, I'd referenced Jeff Perlman a moment ago. I found a, an article that he put on his website, a feature called the Quas, and he asked you various questions in that particular one that I read. He offered a pro tip and that was if you ever have a chance to chat to Jack McCallum mention the name Darren Day what is it about the five-year NBA veteran of the 1980s Darren Day that is worth mentioning all these years later it's an anecdote that is so ridiculous <laughs> I hope people think I couldn't have made it up because <laughs> it sounds made up by the way Pearls is Jeff is the very definition of the modern sports writer, journalist. He works his ass off because he does this research on these books. He's a father. I know he's a diligent father. I don't see him as much as I used to. Jeff's living in California now. He maintains social media at a rate that I could never do. (laughs) And he puts on this website 
when he credits other writers and talks to other writers. Once in a while, I say to Jeff, I say to myself, geez, stop tweeting. And other times I say to him, that is amazing that you took the time to interview these people. And he always makes us look good. He always says nice things. I was kind of a mentor to Jeff a little bit. He came into the magazine at a time when he was very ambitious and very eager. I might have helped him a little bit, but everybody that he puts in the quaz, uh, he writes something nice about. And I think it's a very nice thing that he does. Anyway, Darren Day, 1987 finals, the LA Marriott Lakers Celtics. Darren Day's kind of an obscure guy from the Celtics. This is still Larry Kevin's team. They're, they're probably not going to beat the Lakers, but it's a good series. And I'm at the LAX Marriott where the Celtics were staying. That was just a handy hotel to stay in. <laughs> and I had this big computer then. It was called the, uh, what was it called? It was a giant black box. The early days of the computer, I literally remember this, that when my sons one time unplugged the thing, they tripped over it. I watched my story disappear like a Pac-Man, you know, like this. So I come back into my room after dinner, 10 o'clock or something like that, and Darren Day has his sock off, ready to put his foot into my machine. It had two couplers on each end of it. And I said, Darren, what are you doing? He looks at me, he goes, what's your last name? I said, McCallum. He says, oh, I went to the desk and Kevin McHale had foot problems yeah. since the early 80s. Yeah. He was the first guy I ever heard that wanted to have an ankle transplant. I don't <laughs> want to talk for Kevin, but I think it's a thing. And I think Kevin may have gone through it or should have. So it was a machine that you put your foot in. So the Marriott Marquis had mistaken McCallum for McHale, <laughs> even though McHale's famous. They had given him the key. <laughs> <laughs> to my room. And Darren Day has somehow deduced that rather than being some sort of word processor, <laughs> this is an electronic stimulator uh, for his foot. Oh, man. <laughs> I mean, it sounds like something that would happen in the 50s. That the first time that we had some kind of stimulating machine, <laughs> if you tried to write this on deadline, and I didn't have to do this a lot, but newspaper writers, would have to have this thing and you had to fit the phone you had to crush it down into the coupler to send it and a famous old newspaper writer from the new york times named sam goldapper was covering a bulls series on deadline and he was out and the bulls fans were still making noise and it was disturbing sam trying to send his story on this stupid machine and he calls Brian McIntyre, the great NBA PR man, over. And he says, Brian, could you quiet the crowd? <laughs> could you quiet the crowd down? Because my, my story won't go through. <laughs> and there's, there's 14,000 14, screaming people oh my goodness. In, in, in Chicago. <laughs> Tell a Ram, I'll think of it the moment we uh, hang up the phone. But that was the day that Darren Day uh, tried to put his foot into my machine. The story is so ridiculous that I can't even imagine telling it. It, it. By the end of it, people are going, screw you. <laughs> that did not happen. I go, how could I make that? How could I make that story up? It doesn't sound like it's something that you could make up. That if I was writing a novel, I wouldn't think of it. And then McHale McCallum, M-C-C, M-C-H. They went in two letters. <laughs> They couldn't go in three. Oh, well. so They couldn't go in three. But that's, that's crazy. I'm glad I came across that uh, little uh, tidbit there on uh, Jeff's website. The last quick question I'll have for you. Do you have any plans to write any new basketball-related books? Anything in the woodwork there you're able to elaborate on, Jack? Or? The woodwork is a good way to put it. I've, I've been so involved with this podcast. I did have an idea. I wanted to do something really small about the roots of basketball Something back in the early days, I, I would tell you more. I'm not trying to be coy, but it's really unformulated. And somebody will probably listen to the idea and say, well, that sounds good. We'll give you $2,000 to write it. <laughs> you know, I, I just might want to do it enough that I might say yes. Somebody said to me once, don't you feel you're glomming on to these guys? And I said, yes, I covered them. I was lucky enough to cover them. I wrote thousands of articles about them. 
I wrote a dream team book about them. I let the subject go, de deliberately went to Jerry West and a completely different subject. Now I am back with him talking about Jordan in a 3,000 word column every Sunday and doing a podcast about the dream team. I am sensitive to that. I understand it. But for some reason, once again, it might be a rationalization. The material still seems relevant. People still seem to want it. There's still guys your age that didn't quite live it the way I did. There's something about that team that remains relevant, whether it's Jordan still being an owner, Magic still being a businessman, Charles Barkley being a central figure in our culture, that Larry Bird being the eternal example of the Caucasian immortal that these guys live on. And I hope this is the final thing I do on them. <laughs> and I hope I find something else to write. But whether or not when I do, whether people like you will still want to talk to me is a completely different matter. So there you are. I think the answer is a definite yes, that people will be certainly interested still. And uh, that's piqued my interest very much so. So just in summation, it's been fantastic to have a chance to speak with you for this period of time. You've been really generous. Uh, thank you so much for chatting to some guy in Australia. Uh, it's been a pleasure to have you on the show, Jack, and I hope we can do it again sometime uh, at a future date. The podcast is called The Dream Team Tapes. I'm two episodes in and absolutely loving it. Uh, I love your sense of humor and the anecdotes you're adding into the episode to sprinkle back with the, the audio footage chatting with these great dream teamers. Thank an Australian producer named Mark Francis who did a really unbelievable job helping me put this together because... Mark never said anything to me about the script. He never said I didn't like that. He never did anything like that. All he did was fix it up into this incredible hole. And whatever mistakes I made, he fixed up. And he deserves uh, a lot of credit for him. And I know some of your listeners are going to know, uh, know his father. I wish I would have come better prepared with his bio. Thanks again, Jack. And until we speak again, all the best and stay safe uh, until we get back to more normal times okay Adam thank you thanks for listening I welcome your interaction with the show you can suggest topics or guests you want to hear conversations with send me an email audio clips welcome in all airness at gmail.com time now to share another great review from a fan of the show thanks to Dan Benfer via Apple Podcasts Australia it's titled take me back and it reads not a huge follower of NBA, but grew up with the Prime Bulls and MJ in the 90s on TV and just love this podcast. Professional interviews and great insight that everyone can listen to no matter how deep or not you're into NBA or basketball. Thank you very much, Dan. That's much appreciated, mate. Worldwide, the show now has 159 ratings on Apple Podcasts with an average of four and a half stars with 87 reviews across all providers. Thanks for your continued support. If you add a review, I'd love to read it out on a future episode. Your ratings and reviews are one of the best ways to support the podcast. If you enjoy the show, please do tell your basketball-loving friends about it. Your word-of-mouth recommendations are worth their weight in gold. Stay up to date with my podcast and subscribe to my monthly email newsletter. You'll receive exclusive details on upcoming podcast episodes, future high-profile guests to appear on the show, and more. Simply email me in all airness at gmail.com. You can subscribe to my show in various ways. Search for In All Airness, three words, on your podcast app of choice. The show is on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Overcast, Android, and more. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the show and share my web address with your friends and colleagues, inallairness.com. Check out the podcast archive for plenty more episodes with high-profile guests. Follow me on Twitter at In All Airness. Please add your like to the show's social hub, facebook.com slash In All Join me next time for another edition of the show.